I confess I felt like it was a little bit of a joke to get asked to be um, a speaker at this, to, to ask a folk singer to come and speak at a, an event on technology and culture seems like a bit of a, um, a, bit of a farce. <laughs> um, but I've brought with me three imagined stories from the future, um, written as if they were sort of newspaper or journal articles. There, there are a million different lenses through which you could look at this stuff, but my, my skill is in telling stories and singing songs and engaging with people on an emotional level. I'm not a tech head in any respect. So I have three stories for you. And the first of them takes place in Dundee, um, where I studied philosophy um, as, a, as a teenager. And that's my, my academic background is in philosophical inquiry. So I'm very interested in the ethical implications of technological innovation and where that might take us. And this first story is inspired by someone I used to work beside, um, imagined into the future. So the story is called Betty Bags a Booker. Dundee grandmother Elizabeth McDade is the surprise winner of the 2030 Booker Prize for her debut novel, The Bagging Area. A tragicomic tale of robotics, redundancy and redemption, the story minds McDade's 30 years experience as a cleaner at the former Police Scotland HQ in Dundee, before advanced maintenance bots made cleaning staff obsolete. The transition back in 2024 was brutal, recalls McDade. The government was celebrating the savings to the public purse and there was a lot of guardian guff about the liberation of the human spirit from manual drudgery. We've been trained to turn up and do what we're told for centuries and without work, loads of folk have no sense of purpose or dignity. McDade explains the book's title. Remember 20 years ago when the unstaffed supermarket tills first came in? We were all constantly getting buzzed and red-lighted by those unexpected items in the bagging area. Well, we're in the bagging area now, and that's us, isn't it? We are those unexpected items, and we're still here, and we don't quite fit. Known to fellow staff as Betty Dunnachy, McDade writes under her maiden name, the 48-year-old was a Ducks medalist at Douglas Academy before becoming pregnant in her teens. Former head of janitorial services Derek Brown recalls, she was always a clever one. Betty's been getting printed in the Telegraph letter pages for decades under the name E.R. McDade. Brilliant social commentary stuff, but she never wanted anyone to know about it. When I get laid off, stresses McDade, I wrote every morning at the Wellgate Library just to stay afloat. Thank goodness they never shut that place. Booker judge Ed Sheeran says, <laughs> Elizabeth De Elizabeth's debut work speaks to the opportunities and indignities of contemporary technological change and to the ultimate resilience of the human spirit. Asked if she missed her cleaning days, McDade remarked, I miss the crack and the space to think and imagine. Boredom and rhythm are the mother of invention, and we're just saturated with stimulation now. McDade insists there's nothing remarkable about her, as her ascent. The talents and voices of ordinary people have been lost to soul-destroying work for centuries. So maybe automation does open up new opportunities. At the very least, we've got our stories, and the bots don't have them yet. The Bag and Area is published by Canongate Books. So automation is one of the big things that we're going to have to deal with in the next um, 13 years ahead of 2030. And, and some pieces of research suggest that up to 50% of what we consider jobs now will become obsolete um, by that time. And it won't just be low-skilled labour like cleaning. It'll be um, jobs of prestige, things like accountancy, pharmacy, even skilled um, medical procedures may be given over to, um, to automation. And that's going to be, have a transformative effect on our culture and our sense of dignity as, as individuals. And the whole idea of human dignity is one of the things that concerns me most about this because it's unclear whether or not technological innovation and automation will lead to new creative opportunities, the finding of new talent that's been hidden for centuries under work that was not creative, or whether in fact this is the end of work as we know it. And if it is the end of work, then we're going to be placed, you know, faced with multiple generations of people with no work and no sense of purpose, and we're going to have to find ways to deal with that. And that opens up things that, in, you know, maybe a decade ago seemed like very left field ideas, things like the citizen's income, for example, become things that may become a societal necessity to head off a public health emergency or even civic, you know, the, the unravelling of civic society as we know it. If you have 50% of people with no work and no sense of meaning and purpose, that's got profound implications for how we get along with one another um, in our communities and in our country as a whole. 
Um, it also brings up the issue of, I think, um, of stories. And people don't respond to statistics and data and facts. You talked about how the, the ability to regurgitate facts is, is irrelevant because we can access them at any point. But stories are the way that we make sense of change and always have done. And um, one of the things that's become clear to me in even preparing for this event is how ill-equipped I feel about this area of expertise and endeavour and how much I've had to prepare just to come and talk for 15 minutes about the technological changes that might affect us and how valuable I think it would be um, to create spaces where our leading technologists and futurists work with children and young people for a start because to me my son in his capacity as a Minecraft designer is able to conceive of things that my imagination has shut down even as someone who makes a living now on my imagination and creative abilities and I think as a matter of urgency we need to look at ways in which our leading technologists are working in schools and in youth environments to try and imagine the future because I think my generation is not the generation to imagine what that might be like. Um, and it is through stories that I think raise ethical dilemmas for us that people will be able to make sense of how things might unfold and what our ethical priorities are for how it unfolds in the future. I think it also flags up this issue of values that at the moment most of our technological development is driven by values of efficiency um, and convenience and speed. And, um, and they are very particular values that we've chosen to make the, the important things that run our society. And there are other, are other ways to conceive of um, what's good and what's not good for our, for our communities. And we have choices about that. And the choices that we make now are going to be baked into the kind of technological developments we, we choose to prioritise and invest in and research over the coming 13 years. OK, a second story, and I have to confess that these stories all are all coloured by my own political, political biases, my parental paranoias, and my hopes. So they're very particular to my mindset. And like I say, every single one of us could come up with another, you know, multiplicity of possible ways to look at this. But this one is called Leave Your Phone at Home. A controversial rural housing and mental health support scheme nicknamed the New Luddites looks set to begin development in Argyll in the summer. An initiative of Clash Na Haven Estates, owned for centuries by the McMurrin family, the Haven Digital Retreat and Rehabilitation Scheme will remove existing broadband mass from 10% of the county, ban private drone flights and enforce digital abstinence stones. The scheme conceals a personal tragedy for estate owner Sir Anthony McMurrin, whose 15-year-old daughter Dominique took her life two years ago after a long period of cyber harassment, sexting and so-called dig addiction. My daughter was unable to cope with the 24-hour pressures of digital living, commented Sir Anthony. Alcoholics can't live in breweries, and vulnerable young people need private web-free safe houses too. In an unlikely alliance of old money and neo-radicalism, McMurrin has welcomed so-called digital separatists to the estate. There's board and work available here on our extensive property for people willing to learn traditional crafts and skills, said Sir Anthony. The project will be managed as a not-for-profit enterprise and will sustain itself through voluntary labour, private health insurance, as well as investment from traditional game sports and organic produce. Nick Alder of Lothian Broadband, whose fixed wireless leasehold at Clashnahaven runs out in July, said, Urban areas have standard gigabyte fibre services now and some areas have access to internet drone services, but it's not legally considered essential economic infrastructure. Many remote areas still depend on building masts on private estates to maintain broadband reach and quality. It's another example of entrenched landed privilege holding back economic development, said local councillor Anna McIntosh. This isn't just about interactive film streaming and social media connection. It's about our smart energy networks, our household appliances and health monitoring apps that save rural lives. Local leisure guru Miles Graham disagrees. Sir Anthony isn't right about very much but I'm with them on the drone traffic. It's totally out of hand here, and our sense of wildness, peace and privacy is being lost. A spokesperson for the Scottish Association for Mental Health said, Dig addiction still divides psychological opinion, but there's unprecedented demand for youth mental health support services exacerbated by digital culture, and the NHS can't cope. 
the Haven model of patronage for a combined public-private digital retreat with professionally trained medical staff is both welcome and necessary. So that reflects my own particular paranoia about having a nearly 10-year-old son and a seven-year-old daughter and just witnessing the way that they both thrive in those environments and are utterly sucked into them. And it's also with an awareness, like I'm sure many of us have, about just that constant twitch about your devices and, and how you deal with um, social media. And, and I'm someone who thrives on that for my, for my work. I have to be, inhabit these spaces and do so sometimes with good grace and goodwill, but I'm also aware um, of the pressures that bring, and genuinely concerned for my kids' generation, how, how much more accelerated that might become. So I think it's possible that in tandem with technological innovation, which Scotland is really well placed for, we're also, one of the major things that we sell ourselves on is our natural environment and wilderness, and the lack of tech interface, the, the escape from that, I can see that being a... a, a a big, a big face-off in, like, in terms of values, the need for solitude and retreat versus the need to stay connected, um, are going to be pivotal kind of areas of um, conflict, I think, societally. And, I, and like Chris, I think there's going to be all kinds of um, issues to do with um, the, the, the difference between urban and rural environments and, and the impact that technology has on each of them. And the idea of right now, which we have as our countrysides, as places of retreat and privilege for many, is going to be up for grabs. Um, and there's a whole new legal and ethical framework that we have to consider about airspace above, above land that's not inhabited and who has rights of access to that. One more story. Is that okay? <laughs> um, this one is, is slightly compromised by the um, by the childcare emergency today, but I'll give it my best <laughs> my best shot. <laughs> it's called Karmic Payback. I got a Karma Health tracker for my 16th birthday. Says former accountant. She's been un made unemployed because uh, accountancy is no longer a valid profession. Um, and data generation campaigner Agnieszka Wisniewski. I love the sense of knowledge and control I had about my own body and mind. Like most users of the era, our era, she didn't give a thought to what happened to the information collected by the app or who had access to it. My thinking was, why on earth would anyone else be interested and what harm could it possibly do, says the 30-year-old. It was all about me. I was proud of my health rating and I loved that my karma seemed to know exactly what I needed before I did. When I began meditation and my pulse rate and breathing changed, I began to get recommendations for prayer bowls and herbal teas. It was great. Some people find that stuff creepy, but I felt understood and empowered, and I felt safe. In her early 20s, Wisniewski signed up for an experimental range of underarm implants in tandem with an individualised wellbeing plan targeted at the top fitness bracket of Karma users. The device was so discreet I forgot it was even there, and the health plan benefits seemed like payback for physical effort and attention to diet, as well as a form of insurance for the future, says Wisniewski. I got privileged access to alternative therapies and new dietary innovations based upon my excellent health stats. And in return, I paid modest fees, talked it up on social media networks, and didn't ask questions about my data. I confess I was one of the health elite. The mother of two began to get concerned shortly after a miscarriage and subsequent divorce three years ago. I was struggling to cope. I stopped running and going to the gym and started putting on weight. To begin with, the karma seemed to respond supportively, take some time out, accept a complimentary treatment on us. It felt good. As Wisniewski's sta activity stats fell below elite health level, she noticed the sharply rising costs of access to treatments and a marked change in tone. Ironically, at the time, I most needed support to deal with stress and anxiety and grief. I started to be denied access to therapeutic support because I wasn't investing enough in my own health. I entered the Karma programme at the top health rating as a young, healthy woman, so for 10 years, it never really occurred to me that these services were like gated communities. I felt they were my right because I was working so hard. The technological applications within public health are already well established and have built upon private sector innovations. Last year, the Royal College of Physicians backed a rollout of discrete implants for patients with acute physical and mental health conditions such as bipolarity and diabetes. They do save lives, says our RCP director Norma Blaine, and they help us to target interventions efficiently when and where they are most needed. Wisniewski continues to be ambivalent. I hate the idea that an algorithm determines what's a reasonable length and nature of response to a traumatic life event. 
and it feels like a violation that karma has a record of every time I've cried, slept, got angry, danced, all the fluctuations in my weight, even the birth of my children. It's all in there, says Wisniewski. Most of this isn't official medical history with all the confidentiality that comes with that, but it's out there in the world now, and private businesses are building business models and deterring access to services based upon my personal grief and effort and that of millions of others. So that, that was one of the things that's been a revelation to me in getting prepped for this, is the extent of datification of our lives and our total lack of awareness about how much we give away of ourselves. And the difference between um, data that is private and data that is anonymous. I mean, I think right now we have a feeling that so long as we can't be named as the individuals attached to the pieces of data, it doesn't have any implications for us. And in fact, it does, because the pooling of mass amounts of data um, is really one of the, the key ways in which not only private businesses, but actually innovative public services are going to be determined on the basis of big data. So um, smart energy networks, um, smart traffic networks are, are going to be determined on the basis of all this information. But how it gets used is currently not something we have any control or our awareness of. And so I think right now, not in 2030, we have to start thinking about data generators and data users and data exploiters and, the, and data an analysts and where the power um, lies in those relationships because that, that's already happening now, that's not, that's not futuristic and it's happening in ways that are not transparent to us um, as individuals or as societies. Um, if I could just round up with a, a couple of thoughts, would that be okay? Um, I... Um, so these do reflect my, my fears and paranoias to some extent, but I'm also aware of, of the tremendous benefits and liberations of technological change on a purely individual basis as a, as a, per, as a musician, as someone who makes a living from um, creative output and how that's transformed my life as a maker. Um, I'm now able to um, sample, record, edit, do all kinds of creative work in my kitchen that would have been inconceivable even 10 years ago. I'm able to communicate with people in many parts of the world. And as one individual niche folk market maker, I have, an ex I have a reach that's beyond anything I could have imagined when I was at high school. And that's, that feels liberating and it feels um, meaningful uh, in, in each of those connections with, with people. One of the things that concerns me is that most of our concepts of entrepreneurship are based upon the idea of intellectual copyright. And of, and of having an idea that you, that you have ownership of and can sell and exploit. And actually, the experience of musicians over the past 10 and 15 years, I think, um, raises some questions about whether or not that's a viable concept moving forward. Um, it might seem trite, but the, the transition from making CDs, for example, to digital distribution of music means effectively for someone like me um, that my music effectively has no value in, in, its, in itself, it's mostly streamed on platforms that earn me no income or streamed for free on platforms like YouTube um, where, where no income is generated at, at all from that. And I think that's both exciting because I think it opens up the possibility that, um, that what it is to be a creative person is not an elite profession um, where that's your exclusive identity because now what happens, my kids make music on GarageBand at home. They make some pretty good music, if I'm honest. And the possibilities of, like Betty, of realising your own creative potential are, are written to the way that we lives, live our lives and give our lives meaning. When we make something, we feel purposeful and, and meaningful. But I think it does put in jeopardy these individual classes of um, creative, um, having one singular identity as a, as a creator. And I think... Uh, developments in 3D printing, for example, the whole move towards, um, you know, being able to print up body parts. You know, th these are all these are all things that are are, are happening, and will certainly be um, commonplace by by 2030. It's conceivable that we'll no longer be shif shipping stuff from abroad. We'll be um, printing stuff and making stuff here in response to designs that are available um, through common lease, you know, co free common commons leases. Um, and so there's massive implications for global trade and massive implications for what it is to own the copyright 
in an, in an idea. And I think what's happened to the music industry in terms of not being able to hang on to your um, rights as a, as a maker is about to happen to everything, um, to the physical, all the physical objects that we see and to many other innovations in, in medicine and, and technology. It's going to become harder to hold on to your rights. So I think actually there are huge questions about, about ownership and what it is to be entrepreneurial uh, in general. Um, and one final thing, the concept of entrepreneurship. Uh, going back to Betty's story, um, I think uh, if I could just mention one, one tiny little bit of art that I love, that was a Scottish-made bit of art that opens up this question. It was a little bit of art I saw at the City Arts Centre um, in an exhibit in 2001 by George Wiley, the paper boat man, who's the man who sealed the paper boat up the Clyde. He had a totally little bit of art, and it's a copy of Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations with a steel rod through the middle of it and a wee plaque at the bottom that says, Adam also wrote the theory of moral sentiments. And these two books were his key works and they express different views of what human potential is. The one is a book about economics and the one is a book about ethics and compassion and what we would call empathy now. And I am interested in ideas of entrepreneurship where the profit-making motive isn't the only one that might be a driving force for people. And I think the, freeing, the automation of labour and the freeing up of time and it opens up the possibility that people may be willing to innovate for reasons that have nothing to do with commercial gain. So on balance, I'm hopeful, but I'm also a little bit scared. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>